Sunday worship at FBC Clever. We are so glad you're able to join us online today. If you want to connect with us or learn more about FBC Clever, please visit our website at fbcclever.org connect and fill out an online connect card. This page also has a section for both prayer requests and any questions you might have. Our staff would love to connect and minister to you, so be sure to check out our Connect page. Again, we're so glad that you're able to join us today, and we hope that you're blessed and encouraged by God's Word. Well, good morning, church. Let's come on in. Let's stand. Welcome to church. Hope that uh, your day's already been great. Hope that it only gets better as we come together to worship. Uh, today is Justice's ninth birthday, so we're excited. I was, I was singing to his mama, Jade, uh, in our bedroom this morning. I, I believe it's Bon Jovi, right? The, whoa, we halfway there. Ah, living on a prayer. And we really are with him, living on a prayer. So... Uh, well, it's good to be in God's house. Let's go ahead and join our hearts together in a, a word of prayer and ask God to bless this service together. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you, and we thank you that we can gather in your house and worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you for your many blessings in our life. We thank you for the joy we have in Jesus. 
And Father, we would just pray over this next hour that we would sing songs to you. You're so worthy of our worship and we would reflect on who you are, what you've done for us, and even what you promise you're gonna do in the future. And then God, as we turn our attention towards your word, we ask that you would be our teacher, be our guide, help us to understand, uh, Lord, the depths of the truth and help us to apply it to our lives. We don't wanna be hearers only, but doers also. And so Father, we surrender this service to you. We ask especially though, that if there's someone here who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that through the preaching and teaching of your word, the overflow of our worship, and God, the ministry of your Holy Spirit, that you might bring them to a place of decision and faith where they trust in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of their sins. And we pray in his name and all God's people said, Amen. I mean, take a moment, greet one another, and smooch your spouse. You go. 
was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. And sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you
be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. If you have your Bible, would you turn with me to Joshua chapter 4? Joshua chapter 4. This is our fifth week in our journey through the book of Joshua. We've titled this whole series, Moving Forward in Faith. And that's because that really is the theme of this book. This book is a story of God's people moving forward to lay claim of the Canaan land that God had promised to them. Now Joshua, while it is a historic book, it also serves as an emblematic book for the New Testament believers. See, this book paints for us a picture of what it is for us as Christians to grow spiritually. What it's going to look like is we make a commitment to contend for the faith, to claim greater and greater territory, and to build the kingdom of God. Really, the book of Joshua shows us what the victorious life in Christ looks like. Now, we noticed how the book opened up. In chapter 1, it begins with the changing of a guard. Moses, the servant of God, he's passed away, the great leader for many generations, but now... He's that last holdover from a grouping of people who refused to trust God and to take that promised land. But now a new generation has emerged, and this generation, with their new God-appointed leader, Joshua, they're collectively determined to make the most of their one opportunity to impact eternity. They're going to lay hold of all God's riches for them. And so in chapter 1, we read that God challenges these people that want to move forward by faith, and he gives them an uh, admonition four different times where he tells them to be strong and very courageous. And then chapter 1 ends with all of God's people collectively all in, ready to take the promised land. And then in chapter 2, Joshua sends out those two spies. He says, check out the land, and especially check out Jericho. And so they go into the land and the spies are surprised to discover that God has gone before them into the city. They discover that the hearts of the people of Jericho are melting in fear of God. They are in awe at the power of God, the God of Israel, who has opened up the Red Sea, who sustained his people through 40 years of their wandering in the wilderness. But even more surprising to these spies is they find an unlikely ally in Jericho. Uh, They find this sinful harlot. She expresses her belief in God, the God of Israel, and she gets saved through her faith. And so now this now saved sinner, Rahab, she risks her life to preserve the life of the spies, and in return, they promise to protect her when they return to Jericho to bring the city to ruin. And then when we make it to chapter 3, we have one of the mightiest miracles in all the Old Testament recorded for us in chapter 3. Chapter 3, God tells his people, I want you to step forward in faith. He calls them to follow him uh, through the form of his ark into this raging Jordan River that has overflowed its banks. And we read that in the feet of the priest just got a little bit wet that the water rolled up and stood in a heap. And even the mud miraculously was made to be like dry dirt. And so God opened a channel and the people were able to cross over into the Canaan land. The water was removed and the people just simply walked over into the promised land. And that brings us to where we are this morning in chapter 4. Chapter 4 is a direct continuation of chapter 3. The two go together. In fact, many will preach the two chapters in one sermon. I chose not to, however, because I believe there are some significant truths communicated to us in these stones of memorials that are mentioned in this section. And so this morning, what I want us to do is study this, this little section here. I want us to look at these memorial stones, and I want us to see what these stones communicate to you and I today. And so with that being said, if you found your place in Joshua chapter 4, would you please, if you're able, stand to your feet in honor and reverence of the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. I struggled to know in these narratives where to stop reading scripture and then where to pick up. Last week we read the whole chapter. And so this week, why not read the whole chapter? So Joshua chapter 4, if you're there in verse 1, give a hearty amen. Amen. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, 
Take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one from every tribe, and command them saying, take for yourselves 12 stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and reach. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Verse 8. And the children of Israel did so, just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones from the midst of the Jordan. As the Lord had spoken to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. Verse 9. Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. Verse 10, So the priest who bore the Ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. And the people hurried and crossed over. Verse 11, Then it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over that the Ark of the Lord and the priest crossed over in the presence of the people. And the men of Reuben and the men of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh crossed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses had spoken to them. About 40,000 prepared for war crossed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. They kept their promise to go and fight as well. Now look at verse 14. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel and they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. Then the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, command the priest who bear the ark of the testimony to come up from the Jordan. And Joshua commanded, therefore commanded the priest saying, come up from the Jordan. And it came to pass when the priest who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord had come from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priest's feet touched the dry land that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, that's the month of Nicene, and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Then he spoke to the children of Israel saying, when your children ask their fathers in time to come saying, what are these stones? Then you shall let your children know saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. Verse 24, that all the people of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather in your house, to, Lord, sing songs to you and worship, and now, God, to open up your scripture and to read it. And we know there's power in your words. And so, Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to do what we cannot, to illuminate your text, Uh, Lord, to anoint me to preach and anoint everyone who is listening to hear and to understand beyond just the simple narrative, but to the great truth that's contained within. Father, I pray if there's someone here who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior this morning, you may convict them of their sins and bring them to a place, Lord, of repentance and faith where they trust in you. And we pray all this in the sweet name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. amen. You may be seated. So several years ago, Jade and I had the opportunity to travel to Washington, T.C. uh, with 40 other pastors and their wives from all across America. We were invited to D.C. for the purpose of meeting a number of congressmen and congresswomen and even senators. 
and to speak with them about matters of faith pertaining to the public arena and public policy. And it was a very interesting and once in a lifetime experience. When we were there, we got to meet people like uh, Jim Jordan and, and Ted Cruz. Uh, actually, the Ted Cruz picture, when you look at that one, uh, I wasn't supposed to be taking the picture and he stared right at me right when I did. And I'm like, oh, look at that. Oops, right? Well, part of the trip was a guided tour through our capital after hours when it was completely empty other than the pastors and the pastor's wives. And personally, this is the rotunda. This is a picture I took. You'll notice there's literally no one there. I was given the opportunity, all the pastors even had left, and I was able to stand in the rotunda all alone of our nation's capital and pray for our country. It was a surreal experience. Well, in, in addition to the kind of program events, Jade and I had some free time to visit other parts of D.C. There's Jade on a bike that says jump on it. We thought that was funny. So <laughs> if you've ever been to the uh, nation's capital, you know that there are memorials just everywhere. The Washington uh, Memorial or Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, Jefferson Memorial, the, the Vietnam uh, Veterans Memorial, the Korean War Veterans Memorial, World War II Memorial, just a ton of memorials everywhere. And, and near each and every one of these memorials, there are placards that give a brief history of why that memorial is there. In other words, every memorial has a meaning and a message to share. Every statue you see has a story to share. Every headstone has a piece of history it's trying to preserve and convey to future generations. I mean, the very existence and presence of each one of these memorials signifies there is a significant tale to be told. And in our text today, we see that's what God is communicating. God instructs Joshua to make a couple monuments from stones. Now, you may have missed that in our reading, but there's actually two monuments of stones that are set up. The first remained in the Jordan. In verse 9, it says, Then Joshua, this is Joshua himself, set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they uh, are there to this day. And so this memorial is a memorial that's invisible to man, but very visible to God. Now, we're not told much about this monument other than it's simply to be set up on the spot where the priest stood firm holding the Ark of the Covenant. See, this seems to be kind of a special marker between just Joshua and Jehovah. The passage tells us on this day, God raised up, exalted Joshua in the sight of the people. Well, in private prayer, God had told Joshua earlier when Moses was still alive, he would be the next leader. And so right here, he seems to be covenanting with God saying, God, you promised to elevate me and to make me the leader and be behind me. And on this day, you've done that. And so he just kind of on his own, not even prompted by God, he gets down there and he collects 12 stones, and he stacks them, and he says, I want those to stay right there, just as a testimony between me and my creator that God has been good and faithful to me. But really, not much is said about that monument, so we're just going to let that continue to be Joshua and Jehovah's kind of private monument. What I want to focus on is this second memorial this morning, because the Bible gives us quite a bit of detail about this marker. We're clearly given details regarding the memorial's collection of materials, how it's made, the location of its construction, and even an indication of why it was commissioned by God. Let's look at kind of the collection of the materials. Look at verse 2. We read that there are 12 men, one from each tribe of the 12 tribes. They're selected by Joshua. Verse 2, it says, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe. And then in verse 3, it says these 12 men were each to go back into this dry riverbed and to pick up stones, one each of the stones. Now that word stone in the Hebrew seems to indicate it was a sizable stone. Because in Hebrew they have a word for pebble, they have a word for rock, they have a word for boulder, and then they have this word for like everything in between. So we know it's bigger than a pebble or a rock, and probably less than a boulder. So it's a sizable stone. Now look at verse 5. It says these men are to place this, their stone on their shoulder and to carry that stone out of the river. And according to verse 3, they're to carry it with them, and then they're to leave it, let it down for a moment, in the lodging place where they were to sleep that first night in the promised land. And now notice the construction. In verse 20 it says, And those 12 stones, after they wake up and they begin a journey, which they took from the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Now Gilgal is about 8 miles from the Jordan River. 
So evidently, these are some pretty buff dudes to be carrying these kind of mini boulders on their shoulders for eight miles. And it says that they set these stones up in Gilgal. That phrase, set up in Hebrew, literally means to stack one on top of the other. And so that seems to give us some clear indication of the nature of the construction. If you go to the ark encounter, you'll see these stones are stacked up outside of the ark. And this is how we believe they looked. We don't know the size for sure, but the phrase set up means to stack up. So to stack one on top of the other, they just kind of made this monument, this memorial. And so just a simple stacking of stones structurally was the command of God. Now there's an indication of why this monument was to be set up. Look at verse 20, it says, And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. Then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before you, or before us, until we had crossed over, that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. And so the reason for this marker is simple and straight and plain. These stones are to serve as a reminder of this river crossing, as a memorial uh, to make it easier for them to remember what God had did for them. And so it's kind of a, a cultivation of, uh, and continuation of the story of the crossing to subsequent generations in all of eternity. So it's, a, it's a kind of to pass on the passage story to future generations children. Now, if we look a little deeper though, these stones tell us much more than just that. Sure, they're to mark for the nation of Israel uh, a memorial that God did something mighty, but I believe that if you actually look deep at these stones, they communicate to us quite a bit about our God and what God knows about us and also what God expects from us. And so what I want to do for the rest of this time we have this morning is together study this passage and to look at these stones and see what these stones are still speaking and saying to us today. And because I believe these stones still do speak in several truths. And the first one is God is aware of our flawed memories. I think when we look at these memorials that God said set up, it's communicating to us that our God is aware we have flawed memories. Can I get an amen to that? Aren't you glad God knows what we know? Look at verse 7. Then you shall answer them, speaking of the children, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. And what's the point of the stones? These stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. The Hebrew word that's translated memorial simply means to remember. He says, set these stones up to remember. The fact that God calls them to set up this memorial makes it very clear, number one, he wants this to be remembered, and number two, it shows us that he knows we tend to forget things. God knows that our brains can be like mush, and all God's people said, God realizes we often forget many of the blessings he does for us. In fact, in Deuteronomy 6 verse 12, Moses, in giving sort of his final instructions to the nation of Israel before they're going to enter into the promised land, he says this. He says, uh, beware, in, in other words, be on guard, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. He was already concerned they were going to forget about the Red Sea before they even went over the Jordan River. He's like, guys, be on guard. Make sure you stamp this deep in your brains. And so speaking of that same kind of parting of the waters of the Red Sea, the psalmist in Psalm 106 verse 13 said this of God's people. They soon forgot his works and they did not wait on his counsel. Listen, people tend to forget. We know that's true. I know it's true in my life. If it's not in my phone's calendar, there's a very slim chance I'm going to remember. And you can testify to that because that poor baptism candidate we had last week, his parents told me a month and a half earlier what day he was going to get baptized in. We put it in the staff notes, but I did not put it in my calendar. 
And so he had to bear with me. He'd take it on his chin, a quivering chin, as he went into that cold water last week because I failed to fill it up and to warm it up for him. Why? It wasn't in the calendar. My brain is mush. How many of you get reminders on Facebook of old memories? It pops up five, six, seven, ten years ago. There are many times where that'll happen and I'll look and I'll be like, I don't remember that. I see photographic evidence. I'm there. I wrote stuff about it. And I barely remember doing that. There's an old ancient Chinese proverb that says, the faintest ink is more powerful than the strongest memory. Listen, we humans struggle to hold on to our history chiefly because our minds and our memories are flawed. No person has a perfect memory. Only God has a perfect mind. We can forget the most important things. Isaiah 49 verse 15 said this, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? It goes on to say, surely they may forget. And Miss Nancy was pointing out to me in between services, uh, proof of that is in the car industry now, they have all these alarms and sensors that they've put back in the car seats because we keep forgetting our children in our cars. And the Bible goes on to say, surely they may forget, yet I never forget you. Aren't you glad God never forgets you? And aren't you glad that God is aware that sometimes we forget him and so he helps us. He is gracious. Given man's propensity to forget in his great grace, God told Joshua, construct a visible memorial that can serve as an object lesson to you. A memorial that will jog your memory of my great faithfulness. And so God did this because God knew something that you and I need to also know. Here it is. A failure to remember our history can be a hindrance to our future. Now, this whole book is about moving forward in faith. And listen to me, moving forward requires that we look forward to be sure. But also, I believe it requires that occasionally we glance in the rearview mirror and we remind ourselves of all the time God has moved in power and might in our past. Someone once said this, the greatest enemy of faith may be our forgetfulness. And why is that? Because if we forget how God has worked and provided for us in our past, we may fail to trust him in the future. We may miss future opportunities to step out again by faith and again to experience his great, awesome power. We may miss chances to experience more of his mighty miracles in our present if we fail to remember the times that he performed mighty miracles in the past. And so God told Joshua, I want you to construct a visible memorial that can serve as an object lesson to remind you that I am good, I've been good in the past, and I will be good in the future. And so in verse 20, we see that, that these 12 stones, you would take them from the Jordan, you will set them up in Gilgal. Now, Gilgal is not something we should just pass over. Gilgal becomes a very important place in the children's, children of history in their future. It's in this place in Gilgal that King Saul is crowned the king, the very first king of Israel. And then David, after Absalom over, overtakes his throne and he runs into the wilderness and then God restores the throne. It's in Gilgal that God places the throne back on David's head. Gilgal was one of the key stops that Samuel would go on as the great prophet would prophesy the future of God. And so much of the predictions of scripture that were given by God through Samuel are given to the people of Gilgal for the people of God. But in the present, that is in the time of Joshua's life, Gilgal is going to serve as Israel's headquarters throughout their entire military invasion, through the whole military campaign of this region. Gilgal is going to be base camp. It's from Gilgal that they'll set out and take on Jericho. And we know that story, and we'll get to that story, but after they defeat Jericho, they don't just keep marching on into the land, they retreat back to Gilgal. To, to reestablish, to refresh themselves. And then they go off to Ai and they do battle there. They lose that battle and they come back to Gilgal to get themselves prepared. And we see this pattern continue through the whole northern and southern campaigns. They would leave out and they would return to Gilgal. And so each time they set out and each time that they returned, what would happen? They would stop by and see this stack of stones. 
And they were to remember each time that our God is a God of power. They would be reminded as they're exhausted from battle and sometimes licking their wounds from defeat, they would be reminded again and again, our God is a God who can do the impossible. Our God has been faithful in the past. He'll be faithful in the future. And so this stack of stones would shout basic biblical truth to them over and over again. The God who stopped the waters of the river will be the same God who gives us the strength we need to wipe out our rivals in this promised land. Listen, God knew that they would have memory lapses. And he knew those lapses would lead to faith failures. And so he encourages Israel to set up some remembrance stones in a place where they would see those stones over and over again. And when they come to get refreshed, they'd see our God is mighty and they would go out to battle again. You know, I think our God today would have us to set up some reminders in our lives as well to set up some spiritual memory stones, uh, some things that we can grab hold to that continually remind us of God's power. You know, I think God has set up a stone in the New Testament. I think he set up the stone of Sunday where we would come together in his house and be reminded week after week after week of who we serve, who our God is. I think he set it up. He tells us not to forsake the assembling together of ourselves, that we would come together and be enriched and empowered by the church of Jesus Christ. Each day of the week that we assemble together as believers. What are we doing? We come together and we sing songs. Those songs remind us that our God is faithful. We get a different message from culture all week. We're out there battling. We're battling. We need to come to our Gilgal. We need to come to church and be reminded and see the stones. We interact with fellow believers and we see in their lives stories of God's deliverance, stories of God's power and his faithfulness. Uh, We open up God's word and we preach the gospel and we're reminded every week of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Savior, the one who saved our souls, of who we were before we came to Christ and who we are now that we have come to Christ. And now he's transformed us and set us free and he's changed us. And so God has built in a, a memorial stone in Sunday for all of us to be blessed. And when we pass over Sunday, we're passing over an opportunity to be reminded of the goodness of God. But I think it'd be a good idea for you to establish other memorials in your life that help make it easier for you to remember God's goodness. And so some of you probably already do some of this. Maybe you have some pictures of your kids and your family as blessings at your work. And you set them up and every day you say, man, my God is so good to me to bless me with these loved ones. Maybe you have passages of scripture on on your wall and every day that you're leaving, you and your kids, you see these scriptures and you're reminded of the truths of God's word. Uh, You know, personally, one of the things I do is I review my sermon notes often because when I'm preparing my sermons, what you get is this, but there's additional notes to the side that I make to myself sort of as sort of a journal where I write what God is teaching me through this passage what God is doing in my life. And so when I go back and I pick up those, I can be reminded of how God was working in me and through me in that season. Now, I tried to journal for a year. I hate journaling. If you can do it, do it. Jay journaled for many, many years, and we have a very close marriage. We are open books, and that means we read anything. And so there are many times where I would pick up Jade's journal, and when I would read it, I would read prayers that she prayed for me when I was lost. She would ask God to intervene, to God to change my heart. And I can remember uh, going back and just reading times where she'd praise God. And then I can read the passage of scripture in April of 2007 where she writes in there, you saved him. Prayed, saved. Listen, just reminds us of God's goodness. God knows we have flawed minds. We need to be honest to ourselves and be graceful and say, we don't want to forget your faithfulness in the past because it's going to set us up to serve you in the present and in the future because what you did in the past, we know you are capable of doing in the future. And so when we remember God's blessings, it encourages our faith. It promotes our gratefulness. It it strengthens our resolve and our relationship with God. Psalm 68 verse 19 reminds us, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with blessings and benefits, the God of our salvation, Selah. And so these stones speak. Number one, they tell us God is aware we have flawed memories. But number two, they speak to us today and they tell us that God is still concerned about our faith legacy. 
God is concerned about you and I leaving a faith legacy. Two places in this chapter, parents, specifically fathers, next week is Father's Day, we are reminded of our responsibility for the communication of God's word and our calling to make sure our children and subsequent generations know who God is and what God has done. That's the whole purpose of these stones. Look at verse 6. It says that they may, know, they may be a sign among you when your children ask in times to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And in case they didn't get one of the key points of this, he tells them again in verse 20. He says, those 12 stones which you took from the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Then he spoke to the children of Israel saying, when your children ask their father in times to come saying, what are these stones? Then you shall let your children know saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry ground. Listen, these memorial stones were to serve as, as a basis of sharing their faith with their children. So God wants you and I, hear me, to be people of faith in our own generation. But he's deeply concerned that we would leave a legacy of faith that carries on into future generations. One of my life verses, one of my favorite verses is Acts 13, 36. Because it's my aspiration. This was David's desire. It says this, Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep and was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. That's all I want to do. Just serve God in my own generation. I'm going to die, be buried, and his body's going to decay. But listen to me. We have to have a, a deep understanding of what that means because we could all individually be David's. We could all be men and women of, uh, after God's own heart, as the Bible says. We could faithfully serve God's purpose in our own generation. But if we fail to pass on our faith to future generations, the faith dies when we die and it decays when our body does decay. Listen, our faith is never more than one generation away from fading away. And see, God here, he's concerned that faith would persist. And so he warned Israel. Even before they got into the promised land, he through Moses warned them and said, listen, you're going to be in a new environment. It's going to be a pagan society, a culture that is contrary to everything I stand for. Don't let them dictate your values. Don't let them change who you are. And now to help ensure there's a successful transfer of the faith, God told Joshua to stack up these stones and to make a monument. Now notice, God didn't say, take these 12 stones, Joshua, and just scatter them periodically and haphazardly on the ground on your way to Gilgal. It wasn't like these 12 guys, they're just like, hey, when you get tired, drop it right there, and then they'll drop it, and I'm sure future generations will figure out what that means. No, verse 20, Joshua set up in Gilgal these stones. That signifies that Joshua is to do this in an orderly, methodical, and here's the big word, intentional way, that he was intentionally to place each stone one on top of the other. The goal was to make a monument out of them. Now, why is this important? Why does that matter? Because God knew that a stack of stones would draw attention. He knew that would be an attention grabber. Stones don't stack themselves. Can I get an amen? Just like you didn't make yourself, you can look at a stack of stones and say, huh, that, that didn't just happen. Those stones didn't just get one on top of the other. And so they'll look at it and they'll say, someone put effort into stacking these stones. And so future generations, they'll see the stack of stones and it will beg questions. In fact, God anticipates the questions. He says, your future generations are going to come. They're going to see a stack of stones. They're going to say, hey, why are those stones stacked up like that? And then they're going to say, what do those stack of stones signify? What do they mean? Listen, this tells me something of major significance that I don't want us to miss. And it's to mom and dads. When you live a life of consistent Christianity in front of your kids... What you're doing is, you're not stacking physical stones, you're stacking spiritual stones one on top of the other. I mean, being intentional about your Christian life. And what will happen is that orderly, intentional stacking of those spiritual stones will spark spiritual conversations and future generations. But hear me, if you just kind of cast a few spiritual stones randomly and haphazardly from time to time, it's likely your kids won't take note of that. 
uh, if you just sometimes take a moral or spiritual stand, your kids won't really understand what's happening. When you just read the Bible occasionally, when you never talk about your testimony, when your home isn't filled with biblical language and praise and the fruits of the Spirit, your kids most likely won't think anything of your faith And they won't ask any questions because there'll be no difference between you and all the friends of the parents that they hang out with. There'll be no difference. But on the other hand, if you live an intentionally spiritual life and you are serious about stacking spiritual homes and spiritual commitment in your house, I believe that the orderly erected stones in your life will spark spiritual conversations with future generations because you will stand in stark contrast to the norm. Most people in our generation is the same as every other generation. They just went with the flow of the culture. Uh, Most people, they have no real order or consistency to their morality. They just have situational ethics. We see that in our culture all the time. There are things that are acceptable in culture forever, and then all of a sudden the Me Too movement, now we're morally upset about something. And that'll pass, and then we'll find something else to be morally upset about. But there's no consistency, and the reason is, There's no belief in a higher power. There's no higher allegiance. There's no commitment to scripture. Listen, we can be consistent morally. We can be consistent in our lives. And such a life, a spiritual stone stacked one on top of the other, building a spiritual Christian worldview will cause your kids, mom and dad, to come to you to take note of those spiritual stones. And when they notice how your life is different, it'll naturally lead to them asking spiritual questions to open the door for you to share Jesus Christ with your kids. They'll ask questions like this. They'll say, Dad, why do you pray over the meal before we eat? My friend's parents don't do that. Why do we do that? Mom, why, why do you always look up the movies that we watch before we watch them? Why, why does that matter to you? Dad, why do we always read the Bible and pray before bed? Why are we in church so often? Why do we volunteer? Why do we try to be committed to the community? Why do we give our money to the church and others who are in need? These are questions that they're going to ask as they see these consistent spiritual stones. And you can respond by saying, well, son, we do all these things because of what God has done for us. Uh, God is the one who made us and God is the one who's given us life and, and not only that, he saved us. See, we fell short and we sinned, but he sent his son to die for us. And so God has so blessed us. He set us apart to serve him and to share him. Son, God has been so faithful to us. We just want to try to be faithful to him, uh, not out of obligation, but out of a heart of love. And so we serve him through his help. Verse 6, that's what happened, that they may be a sign among you when your children ask in times to come, what are these stones there for? You can just simply tell them the answer, the truth. Son, the waters opened up of the Jordan. God allowed us to cross through, and we put these stones here so that you would never forget we serve a very powerful God. And so listen, stacked stones will help you transfer your faith to your sons and daughters. You may think, I'm not going to make any difference in my life uh, of any significance. Well, listen, future generations very well may. You don't know the impact your life is going to have if you're consistently stacking stones until generations after you. There's a book, Tim LaHaye, he wrote a book called Your Faith and Your Family. And he sought to illustrate the great legacy impact potential that all of us have as parents. And so what he did was he printed the family tree of a couple known people who lived in the 18th century just to show how their various legacies of faith played out in future generations. The first one is someone you probably know, Jonathan Edwards. He wrote down Jonathan Edwards' legacy. He was that great Puritan preacher who shook New England for Jesus Christ. Another man you may not have heard of, but he was well known at the time. His name is Max Jukes. He was at best a nominal Christian. We're not really sure what his faith was, but he's a wealthy businessman. Well, just listen to what happened to the descendants of Max Jukes. He had 1,026 descendants listed at the time Tim LaHaye wrote the book. Of those 1,026, 300 died prematurely due to poor decisions in their life. 100 were sent to prison. 90 became prostitutes and 190 were well-known drunks. Compare that to the descendants of Jonathan Edward. At the time the book was written, he had 729 known descendants. Of the 729, 300 were preachers. 
65 were college professors, 13 well-known published authors, three were congressmen, and one was the vice president of the United States. Listen, God is concerned about you leaving a faith legacy. If Jesus doesn't return and he tarries, what we set up for our children, these spiritual stones we're stacking, will give opportunity for spiritual conversation. Now, our children must put their faith in Jesus themselves, but we can set it up where every day they come and go from our house, they pass a stack of stones that cause them to over and over again ask spiritual questions and we can give them the gospel over and over and over. I've got a boogie. So point number one, what do these stones speak to us? God is aware of our flawed memories. Number two, God is concerned about our faith legacies. And number three, God is interested in the furtherance of his glory. Let's look at verse 21. Then he spoke to the children of Israel saying, when your children ask their fathers in times to come saying, what are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over the Jordan on dry ground. Verse 23, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. Verse 24, here's the verse, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. When we testify, hear me, of God's goodness, when we proclaim God's power and we display his purity, when we speak of his salvation publicly and we shout it, when we set up these stones that speak of God's strength in our life, we are doing a good thing because we are giving God his due glory. Isaiah 6 verse 3 says, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. One of our chief catechisms of the Christian faith says, Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We have no greater gift that God has given us than to know him. And once we know him, to share him and boast of him because it's not of us, it's of him. God deserves the glory. This is his world. This is his oxygen we breathe. This is his life he's given to us eternally and we get to give him glory. And so stack the stones, live for him so that when people come in, you're not just saying, you're not just talking about an incident. You're talking about the one who caused the incident. You're talking about the God who receives all glory. And when we do that, when we testify, when we shout of the goodness of God, it does a couple things according to this. It lets all the peoples of the earth know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. In other words, it brings conviction on the lost. And they began to question their own lives, which can lead to an opportunity for them to know Jesus Christ. God wants everyone to be saved. And first, they've got to know he's real, know that he's working, and know that he loves them, know their sin is a problem, but there's a Savior named Jesus. So we shout it so that the world may know it. But also, it produces reverence in our hearts as the redeemed. It says that we may fear the Lord, our God, forever and ever. You know what helps you have a holy life? A holy fear of God. You know what helps you to be able to walk forward in faith? A reverence of God, knowing he is the all-powerful one that can remove any obstacle. His might is indescribable. And so when we shout the victory and we set up these stones, we're reminded of that continually. The world sees his glory and we get to live in the midst of his glory. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, and open up this passage. And to read about these stones, these memorials that Israel were to set up to remind them of your goodness and your greatness and to pass it on to generation after generation. And so, Father, we are here today reading this passage and we're reminded that you are the God that opened up the Red Sea and you're the God who opened up the Jordan River. And God, you're the God who opened up a way through Jesus Christ for us to be saved. And so, Father, help us to be a church that testifies to that truth over and over again. God, help us to live lives as individual Christians in homes and families that are being intentional to set up memorials, uh, seeking to remember your goodness that testifies of our salvation to our kids. We share our story of how you changed us. 
Lord, we'll tell stories about how you intervene in our kids' lives in a season of life that they don't even remember. There's some mighty miracles medically that you've done in this church. And God, we get the opportunity to pass that on to future generations and to share that with our kids all so that they may know that you're mighty and you're a good God and that you save sinners who repent and trust in Jesus Christ. God, if there's someone here this morning that needs to trust in you, God, I pray that they would hear the words of the gospel, that you came to this earth, you lived a sinless, perfect life, you died on a cross in their place as a payment for their sin. And the Bible says that you were buried and you rose again on the third day, conquering sin, death, and the grave, And you give an invitation to anyone who hears these words, that anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I pray someone will repent of their sins and place their hope of eternity in Jesus Christ and his forgiveness of those sins. We pray this morning in the sweet name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. We're so glad that you were able to tune in with us today. If you have any questions about the faith or any prayer requests, we'd love to connect with you. Simply visit our website at fbcclever.org connect and fill out an online connect card. This is a simple way to inform our pastors on how to pray for and minister to you. Again, thanks for joining us for worship today and we'll see you next week.